Hi. I'm Dr. Emily. I'm Jonah. And we're from This Little Light. Um, we had a request to do some animal myths, and so we're going to work on those. But first, we're going to say Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day. Day! And in celebration of Mother's Day, which is tomorrow, uh, my mom, well, not in celebration, but just to let you know, my mom just moved to Front Royal. Yay! It's the first time I've gotten to live with family in over what, like? It's been eight years, at least. Eight, eight, ten years. Eight years since we've been near family. So yeah, super excited. My mom's still in Georgia, but uh, so is my dad. We have somebody nearby. It's gonna be great. <laughs> All right. So do you want to go ahead and get on with the myths? Yeah. So we're gonna talk about some of the myths that some people talked about. Um, and then we're going to kind of talk about some others that we didn't talk about. Anyway, sorry. So the first one um, is dogs. And why do they roll in dead stuff, rotten stuff? Um, this one was a fan requested on the blog. So yeah, let's go ahead and get into it. So why do they, doctor? Because they're gross. Dogs are gross. They, they like to roll in stuff. Um, do they like to like hide their scent or something? So I was doing some research on this and it looks like sometimes some people think that they would want to hide their scent from the prey that they're hunting. But in other research, they found that the dogs were rolling in other carnivores feces, meaning that that wouldn't be very smart for hunting. Um, but maybe hide from the carnivore. Yeah. So they think that maybe some of the smaller, um, Smaller predators would hide from the larger predators by making themselves smell um, bigger and badder. Uh, and then the last thing they research, or I, I saw that I read, was that um, sometimes dogs like part to be a part of the pack. They all want to kind of smell similarly. So like packs of wolves will roll in the same carcass so that they've got like team unity. So the next time you're going out for um, um, a team exercise, think about it. If you all reek. Reek together. Reek Fantastic. Together. All right. So the next one is uh, for a dog. Wet nose, good and healthy. Dry nose, he's sick. Is that true? No, this isn't true at all. We get a lot of people that are like, oh, his nose was warm last night. So I know he had a fever. Um, yeah. That's a lot of people report to me. They're like, oh, yeah, he's got a dry nose. So uh, we knew he, he was sick. And this isn't this isn't true. Um, dogs, whether or not they have a wet nose is really dependent on their nasal lacrimal ducts, so their tear ducts, which drain into their nose. Um, sometimes they have, they might have something that causes their eyes to water more. Sometimes they may lick their nose more, which will also wet their nose. And then some dog breeds, like the brachycephalic breeds, such as bulldogs, um, pugs, any of those things with the, you know, the nose that are smushed up against their face, um, that kind of... Smushing breaks up that nasal lacrimal drainage, and um, sometimes they just don't get as wet. So it is not a sign of health or not, unfortunately. And the only way to tell if your dog has a fever is to stick a thermometer up their butt. And then well, don't use that one for people ever again. Do they have? Ever. Do they have like uh, like ear thermometers for dogs? They do have ear thermometers. I don't know how accurate they are. It depends on the dog. And in the end, it probably just is annoying. Right. Dogs don't like their ears touched either. No, I hate it. All right. And so for the last one for dogs, um, is their mouth cleaner than ours? It depends. If you refuse to brush your teeth for your entire life, then maybe. Yeah. Because, I mean, I'm, I'm older than most dogs live. All dogs live. Um, so if I didn't brush my teeth for 36 years, then, yeah, a dog's mouth might be a little cleaner than mine. But in the end, no, um, unfortunately, the number of disgusting, awful teeth that looks like lichen and mold are growing up around the teeth and pus is pouring out from the root um, and the death breath that these dogs come in with, I, I wouldn't want them licking my wounds. That's disgusting. Do you think that may have come from like you cannot get... Like most diseases are, are not zoonotic, so it's not transferred through the saliva. Like I can't get the flu from my dogs. So obviously they're cleaner. Is that maybe? Maybe, but I think no. No. I mean, maybe, but I mean, you can get diseases from your dog's mouth. You can get worms, um, lepto, 
which yeah. is a bacteria that is um, excreted in the kidneys and urine. And um, then like dogs can pick it up by drinking out of water sources that other leptopositive animals have feed in. And that'll kill your kidneys. So I wouldn't do it. All right, moving on. Oh, not yet. I forgot. One more thing. Um, so a lot of people will let their dogs lick their wounds because they think it's good for them and healthy. It is not. Um, the best thing you can do for a wound, especially a brand new incision, is to get that, keep that dog's tongue off of it. Uh, that, that'll just make it really bad and inflamed and the bacteria just gets inserted into the incision and it, it gets really nasty. So don't let your dog lick its wounds. Mm -mm. Clean them out the right way. The right way. Not with peroxide. That is not the right way. That is cytotoxic and will hurt the cells that you're cleaning. Are you done? Oh, I guess you may ask, what, what can we clean our dog's wounds out with? Um, you could do an extremely dilute uh, iodine solution that looks like sweet tea. Um, you could do like a baby shampoo sometimes, but the best thing would be to call your vet. There you go. Call your vet. Always the best advice. All right, so moving on now. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank cats. Jeez. All right. Do cats always land on their feet. Do they? No. Mm -hmm. No, they, they don't. I, I think really the problem with this myth lies in the word always. <laughs> Nothing always happens. Some cats fall. Sometimes they don't land on their always feet. Always never happens. Yeah. But cats do tend to land on their feet. They're very good at maintaining and finding their balance. Uh, is there a reason for that? Are they, are they just better than, than most animals? I guess I don't have a good reason for that. They're very athletic. They've got very um, flexible spines mm -hmm. and they know where they are in the world. Like not where they're going, like I don't know where I'm going in this world, but um, they're, they're like, spatially aware. Yeah. He knows more words than me. All right. So yeah, they don't always land on their feet, but uh, I would say nine times out of 10, sound good. I mean, yeah, if they're not completely thrown off guard, I would say sure. they do. Um, that doesn't mean that you should experiment with this. No. Um, and I've seen plenty of cats that have landed on their feet and then broken their legs. So yeah, it's not always good to land on your feet. Don't let them fall. All right. So, um, what was Ooh, that? I thought of one. What was that? Um, cats get stuck in trees. Oh, meth on the fly. All right. Do cats get stuck in trees? Have you ever seen a cat skeleton in a tree? No. No. They'll get down. They'll get down. I've seen them jump from telephone pole poles. Ew. Yeah. Now I'm like on sure YouTube you have the occasional cat who's so terrified it doesn't want to get down and it may need to be rescued. So I guess I can't never say always. They, yeah, they, they don't never get stuck in trees. But they'll find a way down. Now they may Nine break, times out of ten. Now they may break their leg or back getting out of that tree so yeah they still may, may need to be rescued but my dad always told me you never see a cat skeleton in a tree so i thought that was funny all right so what's the next one uh the next one if you cut off the cat's whiskers does it fall over and have trouble with balance I mean, you want me to answer this one? Yeah, uh, I mean, you've cut off cat's whiskers before, not for fun. No, no. Um, so from time to time, we have to shave the cat's whiskers for surgery, for some other reason. Wounds. I've done it. Wounds, yeah. I've done it several times. They're okay. They're fine. Whiskers are very important, but they're not, they're not that important. totally necessary. Well, I mean, they've got to be somewhat important, right? No. Some men don't have their whiskers. Well, my whiskers aren't longer than my face. They use them for sensory, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they are important, but not uh, not not uh, totally important. I'll tell you, they're much more important to cats like Katina, who have no eyes, than other cats that can see. I mean, it probably helps them in the dark, but it doesn't throw them off balance. It has nothing to do with that. Okay, our cats loners, Tony. So cats are typically loners. Yes, they, they do not like to be necessarily with other cats. They don't need other cats for company. But not every cat is exactly the same. Some cats like to have company. It seems like, um, especially kittens in particular, growing up really want their siblings with them. Mm -hmm. Anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, if you, so, 
cats can definitely have friends or be friends with each other or at least learn to get along with each other. But if you have a cat that's perfectly happy at home, um, I wouldn't go and test the situation by adding another cat because you think your cat's lonely. Your cat probably just wants your attention a little bit more. Um, but if you want to add another cat, there's ways you can do it uh, to try to decrease the amount of peeing all over the house that cats do when they're stressed. Um, you want to put them in a room where they can't see each other and they can maybe just kind of sniff under the door for a couple of days to weeks and then slowly open the door, but have like a baby gate on it so they can see each other, but they can't get next to each other and then just do it slowly and make sure that they each have their own territory. So you have your own litter box and food and water so they don't feel like they're having to defend their, their territory or that they're getting shoved out or something. Cats are very sensitive and when they get offended, they like to poop and pee in places they're not supposed to poop and pee. So keep your cat happy. Why is that? Why does a cat get stressed? Pees everywhere. Well, a cat's stress organ is its bladder. Um, so as soon as it's stressed, the bladder gets inflamed. Um, it can sometimes even have bloody pee and not have a UTI. It's just cats get pissed. Literally. And then they piss. Everywhere, and it stinks. All right, moving on to the large animals. Mm -hmm. Horses are next. So the myth is you should never let your colicking horse lie down. Walk them, don't let them lay down. This is definitely a myth. Um, yes, you should be worried if your horse is laying down, um, but horses are gonna lay down and if they're laying down comfortably and not thrashing, you can let them lay down. If you continue to try to walk a horse for hours and hours and hours, um, you're just gonna tire them out and you're gonna dehydrate them and add to the problem. The best thing you can do is if you suspect colic is to call your vet, uh, because the sooner you can treat them, the faster and better your outcome is going to be. Um, so you can let a peaceful horse lie down as long as they're not rolling? Well, if they're rolling, as long as they're rolling gently. Um, if they're really thrashing, though, you need to probably try to get them up. But again, you need to have called your vet by now anyway. Um, but horses will also sleep laying down. Uh, you know, horses do sleep standing up, but it, they don't get the deep REM sleep that they really need. So they will lay down to sleep. One way you can tell that a horse is sleeping versus colicking um, is when they do get up, if they're sleeping, they often give a full body shake. Just like that. All right. So moving on to the final horse myth of the night. Oh, I kind of... Yeah, you jumped right in that one. Sorry, but it was late. No, down. it fit. It, it meshed down. right there together. So we'll kind of breeze over the second one. Do horses sleep standing up? Mm -hmm. They can. But it's more of a snooze. Yeah, it's a nap. For full, deep sleep, they lay down. Like me and you. Yeah, I don't sleep standing up. Mm -hmm. But they can because they lock their, their, they could, their, their, their knees, right? Sometimes I daze standing up. Oh yeah, it's when called daydream. Right? When I'm supposed to be paying attention. Yeah. But the reason why they can sleep standing up is they they can like lock their, their their legs, right? Well, they have a stay apparatus in their in their legs that help um, them stay. They don't buckle at the knees. Like well named. Mm -hmm. It's a well named apparatus. All right. The last myth is more of a saying: "Healthy as a horse." What does that mean? Are horses generally healthier than other animals? Are they easier to maintain than other animals? I feel like that's a loaded question. Because some horses are easy to maintain, and some horses are looking for a way to die. <laughs> so, no? But yeah. I guess you could say healthy as a horse if you're as healthy as like a really athletic, go-getter, easy keeper type horse. But if you're one of the sensitive founder at the side of grain type horses, then no. Do you think this saying ties into like the uh, strong as a horse or eats strong like a horse? Ox. Oh, as strong as an ox. Mm -hmm. No. That's a farm animal anyway. But like, like the, just the, the go get them attitude. You like eat, you eat like a horse, right? Like, isn't mm -hmm. that a saying? Or a pig. Wait, I don't know. I don't think you eat like a pig. I think that's an insult. <laughs> I think if you eat like a horse, it's like a look that boy. He's hungry as a horse. Maybe that's what it is. Hungry as a hippo. Whatever, never mind. We're done with this. I'm, I'm done. Done with the horse myth sayings. 
All right, so moving on to cows. So supposedly you can have a cow go upstairs, but he will not or she will not go back down. They cannot go downstairs. Total myth. I heard this when I was in vet school and I always wondered if it was true, but then, you know, you go to dairies and I've been to dairies where they have steps up and then steps down and the cows are just like, bloop, and then bloop, they don't care. It's probably like a training thing, right? Like you have to, hey, you, they probably don't want to go up the steps to begin with. But you I've do seen it cows, so I, there was this pasture um, that we used that we passed on our way to the farm um, when I was in vet school that we would practice on some of the horses. And there was a pasture with cows in it. And in the pasture was an old house that was abandoned. And the house had a front porch with some stairs. There were cows always standing on that front porch. They just- They just went up. They're just, they're curious. Cows are really curious. They're almost like cats. Um, so this is not really pertaining to that so much, but why is it that they will not cross those grates? You know the grates I'm talking about? Cattle grates? Cattle grates, yeah. Like, why is that a deterrent? Because they don't want to break their leg. Oh, they're, they're, they're just terrible things if they step in them. They'll... Yeah, I mean, they're, they're cattle grates are basically um, bars of metal that are perfectly spaced so that if you like, if they got their hoof stuck in there, they could really hurt themselves. And animals don't like stepping on things where there's a void underneath them because they don't know what it is. Um, so cows are pretty smart and they will not walk over those. Um, horses will, and that's, they also will hurt themselves easily. But again, they're always looking for a way to die. All right. So, um, do cows lay down when it is about to rain? I have noticed this. I even noticed the other day, um, in our front yard, there was like a herd of deer laying down in our, in our yard when it was about to rain. So is this true? Cows lay down when it's about to rain? I think I think so. I think it's true. I mean, you'll notice a lot they more do. cows laying down when it's about to rain. They do seem to lay down. That. I'm not sure if it's associated with the rain or what it is, pressure or something, but yeah, seems to be true. I don't know why. At least to some, to some extent. All right. So They're probably depressed. Yeah, they're like, just gloomy. Rain gets them down. Suck it. It's about to rain all day. All right. For the last cow myth. Cow tipping. You can go out in the field in the middle of the night, sneak up on a cow. <laughs> Our cat's trying to kill herself. And knock it down. Just push it over. Cow tipping. Can you do it? Um, to quote an article I read, <laughs> I'm sure in the history of mankind, a cow has been tipped. However, with my experience of getting out to the field, and a cow letting you approach them, I would say this is not going to happen. One, the cow's not going to let you just approach them. They don't sleep that deeply when standing. They sleep a lot more laying down than horses do. And two, even if a cow are going to... You could not even get to, the, get to the point where you can get up to them. They're just going to run. It's just they're going to run. Yeah. And then... Or they'll run at you. Right, or they'll attack you. Um... Even then, even if for some reason this cow is blind and deaf and doesn't have any sensory in its body, um, it's still like a 1,200 pound animal with four legs and you've got to tip it over. It's not exactly, it's not top. You're not going to do it. Don't even try. Mm -hmm. You've actually not tipped a cow, but you've had to pull cows over. Yeah, so there is a method where you can pull a cow over, but... They have to already be caught, first of all. So you have to have them caught. You have to have their halter on their on their heads and tied down low to a post. And then you put a rope around their neck and then around behind their um, behind their elbows on their girth area. And then another one right in front of their udder in this one long rope thing. And then you have to have two or three people pull as hard as they can. Um, and it just kind of cinches them up and they kind of freeze and then they just lay down. So if you but can they do that, they don't tip over. They just lay down. If you can do that in the middle of the night, mm -hmm. you're halfway there. And you've been using some drugs on that cow. <laughs> All right. You want to do the goat one? So one of the myths I hear about goats is that they eat everything. Everything. Or the other one that I hear that's simply not true is that you can use them for cutting your grass. Oh, we actually had two goats when we were in college. Milkshake and uh, Yoohoo. Mm -hmm. I was going to call her Yahoo, but that was not it. Yoohoo. And we got them because our pasture was kind of weedy. 
and we needed something to eat the weeds so, so the horses could eat the good grass. Terrible mistake. They ate the good grass. They're weeds not kept dumb. growing. Yeah, they they like the good stuff. They're gonna eat the good stuff before they eat the weeds. That's gross. Yeah. And then goats are little escape artists. They're very difficult to keep in a fence. And when they get out, they're gonna eat all your favorite plants, including your rose bushes. Oh, what's the one plant they can't eat? Azaleas. Azaleas. Azaleas will make a goat literally spew. Yeah. Projectile vomiting. So don't let your goat eat azaleas. No. They will nibble on paper and stuff. Um, whether or not your they can pants, digest, but yeah. But I don't think whether or not they digest the paper, I don't know. But they're not going to eat cans, tin cans, like you'll see in some of the Bugs Bunny cartoons. No. Um, no. Nope. Goats like good grass. They're just like anybody else. They just want the good stuff. Yeah. I mean, can't blame them. All right. So I think that's it for this round of myths. If you have any myths that you want us to talk about, please put them in the comments. Uh, do you have any, any um, hurting thoughts? I was just going to give a little couple of thoughts. By all um, means. I hear a lot about, uh, well, I see a lot in the stores, you know, the antibiotic free meats. All meats antibiotic free. Yes, the farmers will use antibiotics to treat their sick cows because they don't want them to suffer with a disease. Um, but then there's uh, an FDA approved withdrawal period, which is how long the cow or pig or whatever has to have not been on the antibiotic before it is okay, before its body has cleared the antibiotic and it is no longer in the body. And once the meat is processed, it's all tested for antibiotics. So none of the meat you buy is going to have any antibiotics in it. None of it. And if they find antibiotics during the processing the farmer gets fined huge fines and it's just not even worth it to them. So they don't even sell their cow until that FDA approved USDA, whatever it is. I don't remember, uh, has gone through the proper time period. All right. Anything else? The other one is hormone. <laughs> um, a lot of people are worried about hormones in the meat and how it affects people and children. There's, we don't treat cows. We, there is a growth hormone that they'll use in, in cows, um, but it is basically essentially replacing the hormone that you would get from having like a bull. So if you castrate a, a bull calf and then they don't have that testosterone anymore, then they give them some of this stuff to make them, it was as though they had testosterone. So it's no more hormone as you would in a normal, fertile, healthy animal. Um, also, there's like... I can't remember anymore, but it's like 10 to 100 times as much estrogen in soybeans than there is in an intact female cow meat. Yeah, so soybeans are huge in estrogen. Yeah. All right. Is that, is that it? No. <laughs> I can keep going. All right. Well, we go ahead. So another theory as to why, um, so one of the things people are worried about with hormones and, and meat is that they feel like um, children are going into puberty earlier. And this may or may not be true. I'm pretty sure children went into puberty super early, way back when, when you'd start having children at 13. Yeah, kids um, used to have kids, babies having babies at like 12, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think just our society has now thinks that's taboo. And so it's not as quietly, as quietly. It's not as quietly accepted. Uh, but the other theory is that um, with the increase in the amount of nutrients available to children and their increased body condition score or um, increased fat quantity of their body, often the body doesn't go into puberty until it has enough calories, it's grown, it has enough calories to go into puberty. But if children already have all those calories, and have ex, um, a little bit of excessive weight or fat going on, then their body will go ahead and kick into puberty. So that's another theory. But really, really, people, children have been going into puberty young all along history. So it has nothing to do with the meat. Don't blame the meat. That's what it's what we genetics. do. Our bodies like to have babies. They do. Our bodies are made to have babies. That's so sweet. Babies are. They are. They won't go to bed. He's getting better. Anyway.
Anyway, it's a whole different rabbit hole. We're already, already running a little long. So uh, this is it. I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you tune into the next one. And just a quick shout out to New Realm Brewery. This one is fantastic. That's what I've been drinking. And I don't know what you're, you're just drinking wine, so. Cheap wine. That's Cheap fine. wine. All right. Have a good night. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day.